Hello, everyone. Um, hopefully, you're seeing us right now. There's uh, attendees are filling in. Um, we haven't start. We're recording right now. Just so you guys know, this is going to be a recorded webinar. And I have a little bit of an intro. It is 11 o'clock, and I'd like to start on time. So, hello, everyone. This is uh, my name is Darren Michaels. I am the host of this brand new hour-long semi-regular webinar series from Scott Laboratories, where we discuss interesting topics and try and answer questions related to wine, cider, or specialty beverage production. From yeast and nutrients to stabilization and filtration, we dip into the Scott Labs vault of over 80 years of experience to bring you the latest in research and technical applications. We hope these webinars will spark the flame of conversations and bring together the old and the new the classic and the innovative. Again, I am Darren Michaels. I am your ho host during this journey. I'm a Scott Labs fermentation outside technical expert, originally from California, now living up in the Pacific Northwest in the beautiful Columbia River Gorge. It's been a little rainy and cloudy here, and there's, but there's some sun in the forecast, and we are, believe me, are very much looking forward to that. I wanna thank you for all attending and can't stress enough how thankful I am that you took time out of your day to join us. For some quick webinar tips, make sure you can see the mute and video button on the lower left. And along the, along the bottom, the participants button and the Q&A button, which will be the main channel for communication. You can change audio settings in the up arrow menu next to the microphone icon if you are having issues with your audio or microphone, and you could also test it as well. Don't forget the participants button and there's a raise your hand button. I'm very happy to welcome you to what I consider to be a very special treat, and that is a discussion with Dr. Nicola Hall and a presentation about taming the beast within your wine, new and old ways to prevent microbial spoilage. This webinar is for anyone who wants to know the why and how of spoilage control. There's things that I've been doing for years that have worked time and again, but sometimes without a full understanding of the mechanism. And of course, there's new things that weren't available before, that are exciting and whose applications are just beginning to be fully understood. If sometimes in the industry, it feels that at best you are herding cats or trying to bottle a snapshot between juice and vinegar, I think you're right. At the end of this webinar, I hope you come away with a strong framework on how to try to manage these beasts with the tools that are available. We'll start with the type of microflora that can cause spoilage and touch on the concept of fertile technology and move into current control agents and their mechanisms and finish with some dosing tips and some action specificity. During the talk, I will be posting several quick polls. Feel free to fill out. After the talk, we'll have some time for question and answers. If you have any questions that occur to you during the talk, feel free to post the questions on the Q&A section. That's the bottom on the lower right, on your lower left. For those that have submitted questions before, we'll try and get to those as well. I'll also be keeping an eye on the participants window and looking for those hands that have been raised. Right now, chat is set up so you can only chat to the panelists. Um, there won't be any um, co-chatting. I'll try and keep an eye on that, but your main source of communication will be the Q&A section. So go ahead and type any question that occurs to you when and Nicola is speaking. I'll be watching the participants if there's any issues you think we're going too fast, we'll try and get slow, but Nicola's really good. She's been in this for a long time and I'm very happy to have her. Afterwards, as a survey, please fill that out. Um, that's got a couple questions, but really it has a space for ideas for future topics that you would like us to maybe touch on in future webinars. And just so you know, we'll be recording this webinar again. We'll make it available as soon as possible. I want to might, might do a couple edits maybe, but essentially it should be available for anybody who's watched this or at least tuned in or registered for this webinar. Let me know if you have any questions. Uh, my, my email is darrenm at scottlab.com, D-A-R-R-E-N-M at scottlab.com. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over the microphone to Dr. Nicola Hall. She is our staff scientist at Scott Laboratory. She has a PhD in yeast physiology. So thank you, Nicola, take it away. Thank you, Dan. Thank you so much for the very kind introduction. And thank you to you all for taking time out your busy lives, a little bit unconventional lives right now to join us. It's an absolute pleasure and privilege to be chatting with you virtually today. So as Darren mentioned, we're going to be discussing microbial control agents, some of them that you quite possibly very familiar with, some of the new tools that might be um, applicable in certain aspects of your wine production. So we will go through, through that. So I'm going to share screens with you. 
and go through the presentation as Don says and take Q&A at the end. So with that, I'm going to pop over into PowerPoint mode. Give me a moment as I do so, please. And I'm going to move you all over to the side. Okay, so uh, welcome to Taming the Beast, Tools to Prevent and Control Microbial Spoilage in Wines. So as we're all aware, it shouldn't be a surprise to any of us that there are, is microflora coming on, in on the fruit. Generally in the vineyard, even with good integrated pet, pest management plans, we'll have non-saccharomyces yeast, which is a very diverse group of organisms, about 20 different genre, probably up to 700 different species that come in, um, generally in the population level of 10 to the 6, so a million cells per milliliter. We also have lactic acid bacteria that come in on the fruit, lactic acid bacteria, uh, uh, the genus Enococcus, Lactobacillus and Pediococcus, generally in the range of 10 to the 4 cells per milliliter, as well as acetic acid bacteria, uh, 10 to the 2 in general. Now the acetic acid bacteria is the acetobacter, the gluconeobacter, and the acetogluconeobacter. Now that is in healthy fruit. If your fruit is compromised in any way, shape or form, those numbers will change uh, dramatically. And when we're looking at the great microflora, that is, once we take the, the, the grapes off the vine, that is a very dynamic transition between the organisms and how the organisms are going to react with the, the grape juice or the grape mass. So when we talk about juice microbiology, we're not talking about it in a vacuum, we're talking it in um, about it very much in conjunction with the juice chemistry because it is the chemistry that is going to be one of the major drivers of the microbiology, pH being a key factor with above pH 3.5, uh, the environment is much friendlier for the growth of those bacteria than below pH 3.5. So uh, the non-saccharomyces uh, require oxygen. So uh, getting up to about 5% alcohol as quickly as you can. So you have uh, a, a lot of CO2 being generated, which will start to suppress the, the metabolism of a lot of those non-saccharomyces organisms. And um, remember at the beginning of fermentation, if you are seeing volatile acidity being produced, it is generally uh, the non-saccharomyces yeast that is, is producing that organism or that uh, acetic acid. When we move into the fermentation environment, the acetic acid bacteria due to selective pressures and not having the oxygen they require, they will go into a viable but non-culturable state. So what that means from a microbiological perspective is they're still present, they are not metabolically active, and you're not able to grow them up on a nutrient-rich media. So they're, they're essentially disappearing from the picture using traditional microbiological tools, but using a new age genetic screening, we could pick up our acetic acid bacteria du during fermentation. The yeast during the fermentation, the non-saccharomyces start to die off and saccharomyces being the organism of the winery takes foothold. When you're inoculating with your active dried wine yeast, uh, two pounds per thousand gallons, you have about three to four million, so three to four times 10 to six cells per milliliter. And we'll say you're completely implanted when you're at 10 to the eight cells per milliliter, so 100 million cells. Per mil. That implantation is what is killing off a lot of the non-saccharomyces yeast. And your lactic acid bacteria will continue to grow during the alcoholic fermentation. Sometimes they can grow 
uh, very quickly. And at the end of the alcoholic fermentation, when your Saccharomyces is in a very weakened state, your lactic acid bacteria can actually be high enough to suppress the Saccharomyces. So looking at the wine microflora, we do have to pay close attention to the chemistry to know what is happening. Looking, the challenge if you just look at the wine microbiology, the presence of the organism does not always dictate, or do, might, the, the, the organisms that are present might not be imparting any chemical changes. So if you just look at the microbiology, you might not see what is happening in the wine. Likewise, if you just look at changes in the chemistry, whether that's the juice chemistry or the wine chemistry, you might not be able to attribute which organism is causing it, therefore to control those organisms is going to be very, very uh, difficult. So we look at juice microbiology, juice chemistry, wine microbiology, and wine chemistry in concert. So the more information we have, the more, more decisions that are quality-driven decisions and data-driven data decisions that we can take. So information is the key to microbial control, both the microbiological information as well as the ke chemical information. Now, if we're going to be sampling with regards to microbiological control, you've got to actually take it out a sample that is going to be representative. And non-representative samples are one of the largest sources of error in our industry, both on the micro side as well as the chemical side. Remember the sample that, or the analysis that you get is on the sample. And then you are relaying the information from that sample to your vessel and if your sample is not representative of the vessel, then that is where your error is coming in. Striations do occur. They occur during fermentation as well as post-fermentation. So the best practice for sample collection is a um, homogenized sample or a sample post-mixing or post-racking. And part of the reason for that is our organisms, we're going to see um, they're going to be in their preferred enological niche. So they're going to be different areas in the vessel. Whereas your acetic acid bacteria, you're going to find up at that liquid gas interface. So right on your head space. The lactic acid bacteria, which are micro aerophilic, are going to be somewhere in the body of the wine. So kind of in the middle to, to the bottom of the vessel. And your yeasts are generally found associated with the lees. So, so getting that mixed sample is really important so you get a good representation of the microbiological picture. If you can't get your sample after a racking or a good mixing, building a vertical composite sample is acceptable where you're going to take an equal amount from the top, the middle and the bottom. And then remember vessel to vessel variations do occur as well. So making sure that you've got enough sampling in your plan to, to uh, determine the true microbiological flora in that, in that wine. The other thing um, that we, we want to remember is we don't want to, when we are sampling, go from vessel to vessel and, and cause cross contamination. So always when you're sampling for microbiology, if you want to be as accurate as you can, you do want to have sanitized these sanitized sample valves, etc. So we want to know what the microbiology is. We want to know what the chemistry is so we can detect any changes that may be occurring and any of those changes that may be um, causing microbiological spoilage. And what we say as a definition of spoilage is it is considered to have occurred if the growth or metabolism of a microorganism imparts an off aroma or mouthfeel character to juice or wine, or there is a change in physical appearance. And, and I do like this, this definition because it encompasses uh, a lot. It discusses changes that can happen in juice and wine, 
We talk about wine being a hostile environment, which is very true. However, juice is not. So you've actually got to get it to the wine so you could suppress a lot of the spoilage organisms. But spoilage, you can have a change in aromas. You could have a change in texture or a change in the visual appearance of wines. All three things have to be considered when determining spoilage. And spoilage, uh, it is, it's not that easy to occur. For it to actually occur, you must have the organism present. You must have the conditions conducive to growth and metabolism of that specific organism. And you must have an interaction between the specific organism and the specific components so that you are seeing that change in aromas, in texture or physical appearance. And microbial spoilage can be overt or covert, to, to paraphrase Dr. Dicenzo. Overt spoilage is when there is quite obviously something wrong. My wine tastes like vinegar. My wine smells like a barnyard. Um, but quite often, spoilage can be covert. So it's not quite as obvious. It's just your, your wine has maybe lost some of its fruitiness. It's not as bright as it once was. There's just something there that is hinting to, to problems. The other thing with overt spoilage, uh, covert too in that matter, is you must recognize the different flaws associated with the organisms to determine whether spoilage is occurring and understanding sensory thresholds and if you are actually even able to detect those thresholds. Some people are as anosmic for certain um, spoilage, uh, especially things like mousiness, they're not able to detect that. So making sure that you're not tasting in a vacuum, that you're working with other people to detect what is going on in your wine. So how do we stop spoilage from occurring? How do we stop these organisms from being present and metabolizing specific, com specific components in our wines so that we are having a deleterious effect? Well, we apply, employ hurdle technology. And hurdle technology is something that the food industry has embraced for many, many years. It's somewhat a newer um, phrase in, in the enological environment. So hurdle technology is when you apply different strategies and these strategies work synergistically to suppress the, the organisms and the organisms from having an impact. In our industry, we look at chemical hurdles, environmental hurdles, and physical hurdles. And the more hurdles that we have, the, the better the chance of controlling the microbes. Now, our chemical hurdles can be microstatic or microcidal. And it's important that, that we understand the difference. If something is microstatic, it is stopping the organism from growing or stopping the organism from imparting their, their deleterious effect. If a microbial control agent is microcidal, it is actually killing the organism. So working with microcidal compounds is, is much better because it, with microstatic compounds, once that pressure has been removed, that organism may continue to, to metabolize again, uh, causing subsequent spoilage. So as we go through our different chemical agents, We'll talk about whether they are microcidal or in fact, if they are microstatic. So the agents that we're going to chat about uh, in the chemical form, SO2 and pH management and how they're highly interrelated. We'll discuss lysozyme, we'll, we'll discuss chitosan. Sometimes I call it chitosan, sometimes chitin derivates, sometimes chitin derivatives, um, but I, I'm really referring to chitosan. Uh, ethanol as a uh, chemical hurdle. We'll discuss sorbic acid. Uh, we will not discuss Valkyrin, but that is a chemical hurdle. 
and we'll finish off with really briefly discussing the environmental and the physical hurdles as well. But remember, one of the keys to success in microbial control in our industry is winery hygiene. Having high, highly effective and efficient sanitation standard operating procedures so that you don't have biofilms building up and you're operating in as clean an, an environment as you possibly can. So with that, let's look at sulfur dioxide, uh, something that's been used in our industry for millennia. And it's something that is used without us really thinking much about it. Uh, and hopefully over the course of the next few slides, you'll get a better understanding of how sulfur dioxide does work in our favor. So sulfur dioxide, remember, has antioxidant as well as antimicrobial properties. Those are the two major properties. Now, in today's winemaking, when people are trying to scale back from sulfur dioxide, we do have alternatives on that antimicrobial side. And that's what we will discuss today. We are starting to have more and more um, alternatives on the antioxidant side. So things like our Glutastar, which is uh, able to scavenge quinones, tannins, which scavenge oxygen. So you would have to, if you're scaling back on sulfur dioxide, replacing not only its antimicrobial activities, but also its antioxidant properties. So let's look at it. I'm sure everybody has seen this, this graph here before, but let's explain it just so that we're all starting off in the same footing. When we deal with sulfur dioxide, we are dealing with something that we have called total sulfur dioxide. And the total sulfur dioxide is going to be distributed into different forms. Essentially, the majority of sulfur dioxide when you first do an addition is going to be in the bound form. It may be very, very tightly bound. It may be loosely bound. And that loose bound can go between the free and the bound. But generally, um, your first SO2, add the majority is going to be bound. It could be 70%-ish. Uh, and then after you, it has bound all of the compounds, it's going to bind then to the free form. But when we talk about sulfur dioxide in the free form, we're talking about three different um, compounds. We're talking about molecular sulfur dioxide, bisulfite, and sulfite. And the amount you have is going to be dependent on the pH. And you can see that in this chart here, pH along your, um, your scale and then on your y-axis, the percentage of the different forms according to pH. So when you are at a low pH, you can see the majority of your SO2 is in the molecular form. And it is the molecular form that is the antimicrobial form. As your pH increases, your antimicrobial form decreases and your bisulfite, which is your antioxidant form, increases. And we say to have a microcidal effect of sulfur dioxide that for yeast, the general rule of thumb is 0 0.8 milligrams per liter of molecular SO2, and for bacteria, 0 0.5 milligrams per liter. Now that is dependent on the alcohol concentration, the temperature, the population density and diversity, the population resistance. But that's generally a good rule of thumb. We're gonna give you a lot of generalities today. So how do you know if you're at 0 0.8 molecular, 0 point molecular, or somewhere above or below that? Well, generally we're going to look and see wine is between pH three and four, which means that we've got above 92% in the bound form and less than 7%-ish in the free form. So the quick check, to see if you are at your desired molecular uh, SO2 level to keep the organisms at bay 
is 0 0.5 or 0 0.8, whatever you've decided is your desired molecular SO2 level, divided by the percentage molecular at that given pH. And that tells you how much free SO2 you need to protect this wine um, from microbial spoilage. To, to know what the percentage is at the different pHs, it's pretty hard to tell from this little part of the curve on the graph. So we use the table. And this table, as you can see, at pH 2.9, we've got 7.5% of our uh, free SO2 in the molecular form. And as the pH increases, the percentage of the molecular decreases so that when we are up at pH 4, we only have 0.64% in the molecular form, which means your SO2 dosages should change based on your pH. If you don't want to remember this chart or don't have the chart handy, you can work it out long way mathematically and using these equations. So it would be your molecular SO2, or to determine how much free SO2 you need, it is your desired molecular SO2 times by one plus 10 to the pH that you're currently at minus this figure of 1.81. And that figure of 1.81 is what we say is the disassociation constant to the first degree for sulfur dioxide. So you could plug that in. Likewise, if you're at a given free that you've measured analytically, you know what it is, and you want to calculate what that is with regards to molecular, again, you plug it into a rearranged equation and that gives you that information. So, so how does SO2 work as an antimicrobial agent? Well, that SO2 does not have a charge associated with it. So our S, once it goes into the cell, the inside of the yeast is around about a pH 6.5, kind of 5, 8 to 6, 5. So that means that the molecular SO2 you've added is going to undergo this pH-driven dissociation inside the cell. So you're going to have more of the bisulfite and the sulfite that you don't have in wine. And these forms of the um, sulfur dioxide rupture the disulfide bridges and proteins. They interact or they react with the cell's ability to pr um, produce NAD. So it interferes with the cell's um, ability to shunt hydrogen ions between different forms for continued metabolism. It interacts with ATP, which is the energy source of the cell. So if you add enough of your SO2 in the molecular form, it actually kills the cell. If you don't add enough, so if you're not hitting your 0 0.5 molecular, your 0 0.8 molecular, it might just put it might just stop the cells from growing further. Therefore, SO2, we say, can either be microstatic or microcidal based on the concentration. So what do you have as an option of SO2 from your Scott Labs portfolio? We have potassium metabisulfite, which is granular. We have a liquid version of of SO2 called sulfavin, and we have inner dose granules as well as tablets. And remember, these are all going to add total SO2 to the wine. These do not add free SO2 to the wine. Therefore, um, you have to take that into consideration. The other thing that you have to take into consideration is measuring your total SO2. If you're not measuring your total SO2, you don't know if your SO2 that you're adding is being effective. So there's some simple math involved in it, but if we go through the math, we'll see that two moles of SO2 is derived from one mole of potassium metabisulfite, which I shorthand, like most people, to KMBS. And KMBS is about 57.6% SO2 when it's fresh, 
a lot of winemakers will use 55% as that. So you have to take that into consideration in your math. And if anybody wants to work through the math, it's there on the slide for you to do so. Likewise, if you're working with liquid um, SO2 and that's been prepared just by um, bubbling it into water, that is 100% active. So there's no potassium in there. So you don't have to take that 57 or 55% into the, the, the calculation. And generally our industry uses six to 8% liquid. And as I said, Scott Labs has a liquid SO2, which is 150 grams per liter of KMBS. So it's not 100% active because you've got that potassium in there. It's about an 8.65% solution. So calculating your liquid adds amount to add in mils equals desired SO2 in milligrams per liter, which is PPM, times by the volume of your wine in liters divided by your SO2 concentrations. Okay, so you want to verify those concentrations. It's really important that you do because as soon as SO2 comes into contact with the atmosphere, it's going to lose some of its potency. And how we determine our liquid SO2 is generally through us, or how we determine any solution of SO2 is generally through specific gravity. Now remember, specific gravity is a density measurement, so it's going to be impacted by both temperature and pressure. So if the industry generally uses between six and 8%, at 6%, you're looking for your specific gravity to be round about 1030. Um, 1030 is the same as 1.030. It just depends if uh, what units of measurement I'm using. But it's important to verify your SO2 um, concentration. The last SO2 um, that we have, one of the things I thought was the most amazing little tool coming from large wine environment to the supply side is SO2 prepackaged to give a very precise dose. Um, so it's taken away the math and because they're all prepackaged, you don't, you could, it's a little bit safer to use in the cellar. So the inner dose tablets and granules are 66% KMBS. So remember just over half of that is active SO2 and 33% potassium carbonate. And it's not enough carbonate in there to impact the pH. So again, your two gram of SO2 will give you nine parts total SO2 per barrel. Likewise, the 100 grams SO2 will give you 26 parts per thousand gallons. So pre-measured SO2, um, which are pretty neat little guys to use. So adding SO2, check your math, double check your math, triple check your math if you have to do so. Verify your concentrations, make sure you are actually using the correct concentration. If not, you're adopting for that difference. And when we add SO2, we think it's added, voila, there you go. But it actually takes a little bit of time to homogenize. In some larger vessels, it could be up to 72 hours. So if you want to see if you have a homogenous SO2 add, then you could take a sample from the top of the tank and the bottom of the tank, run totals, run freeze, and see how close they are. And if they're within analytical error, then you have a, hom a homogenous um, addition. So SO2, still an effective tool, something that we still rely on in our industry for its antimicrobial and antioxidant properties. In high pH situations, we don't get that microcidal effect that we're hoping for to stabilize our wine. And especially in high pH situations, and I talk about that as a microbiologist, so anything above pH 3.6, then other uh, organisms will take hold. So that's why we want to look at some other microbial control options um, to, to, to help us out in those situations. 
So the next one we're going to discuss is lysozyme. So if SO2 in the form of um, it, it, its ability to kill cells is broad spectrum, lysozyme in the enological environment is relatively narrow spectra, spectrum in the fact it's active against lactic acid bacteria. So that's what LAB stands for. Lysozyme is isolated from hen egg whites. It is what we call a muramidase enzyme. So it's the same enzyme that you have in saliva and you have in your tears. Um, there is a little bit of lysozyme in uh, egg white finding. It's just not going to be enough to act as an antimicrobial agent. So as I mentioned, lysozyme is effective against lactic acid bacteria and lactic acid bacteria are enococcus, lactobacillus, and pediococcus. And what lysozyme does specifically is it attacks the outer layer in the bacteria, in the gram-positive bacteria. And this outer layer is what we call a peptidoglycan layer. So it goes in and interferes with the glycosidic, so the sugar-linking bonds in this cell wall, if you will, which causes cellular leakage. Why does lysozyme not work for acetic acid bacteria? Well, the peptidoglycan layer in acetic acid bacteria is actually protected by another membrane on its outside. So the lysozyme just can't come into contact with its site of action. So lysozyme is uh, from egg whites that is for bacterial control. The one thing um, and something we're, we're very proud of at Scott Labs is full disclosure and transparency. So with lysozyme, we're going to say that you are going to, it's very, very effective against lactic acid bacteria, but you might not always get 100% kill rate. And we can see that in this uh, little table that uh, is from Ribero Guignon's Handbook of Immunology, Volume 1, looking at lysozyme dosage on different cell populations in different environments over different times. So if we just look at the first uh, three columns, we'll see our lysozyme doses, 4 to 16 milligrams per liter, impacting uh, lactic acid bacteria in red wine at 18 million cells. After four hours, at four milligrams per liter, we're down to 2.6 million, whereas at 16 milligrams, we're just under 16,000. So we'll say that you, your um, dosage has an impact in a very short period of time on population. Um, after 24 hours, however, you're, you're all hovering about 2,000. So it's at a pretty fast uh, contact and kill rate. So the impact is dependent on, as I've just shown, dosage rate and time. It's also uh, impactful on population size, population diversity, Unlike SO2, lysine is actually more effective at higher pHs. However, it is negatively impacted by the presence of binding compounds. So as I mentioned on the previous slide, lysozyme is an enzyme. Enzymes will be bound up by bentonite and tannins, which we can use to our advantage um, as well in the fact that the impact of lysozyme in red wines is relatively short-lived, and we can inoculate with VP41 72 hours after a lysozyme addition in red wines because of that tannin binding. In white wines, you don't have the same tannin profile, you don't have that tannin binding, so you, you will want to remove it from the system with a little bit of bentonite, half to a pound per thousand gallons is generally enough to remove it. So the lysozyme available from Scott Labs is a granular formulation. 
And that granular form formulation has to be activated so that you get the active enzyme um, to attack the lactic acid bacteria. And lysozyme is pretty cool. Like SO2, it can be used at all stages of the winemaking production, all the way from juice and mast to help to um, delay malolactic fermentation for post ML stabilization and during blending. So because we said that lysozyme activity is impacted by concentration, by population size, generally after ML, you have got more than uh, a million cells per milliliter. You could have one or two logs higher, which is why you're, that is reflected in your dosage. So this is um, just directly from the 2020 handbook. So it is there published for all to see. Chitin derivatives. So chitin derivatives, chitin uh, derivatives, chitosan, the different names I use, they're active against lactics, acetics, as well as Britannomyces. So a little bit less broad spectrum than sulfur dioxide, but definitely more broad spectrum than lysozyme. So the, the chitin is, um, it use, it's been um, utilized in food preservation and cosmetic preservation for many, many years. It was actually originally derived from the exoskeleton of shellfish. Because shellfish are known allergens, the chitin in our portfolio is actually derived from Aspergillus niger. That is the same organism that we get our enological enzymes from. So the chitin is a non-allergenic. Now we get chitins that are antimicrobial agents. We get chitins that are antioxidants. So it's a very diverse molecule. We get chitin derivatives that are actually used for clarification. And the difference in what the application is, is how the chitin is prepared. Really the impact of the polymer lens. So chitin is a biopolymer. It's a, a very, very um, diverse polymer found in nature. It's actually what yeast lay down after into their cell wall after they divide. So it's something that, that um, has been studied quite extensively. So with our chitin derivates that are antimicrobial, we do see a several log reduction. So a log reduction is, for example, going from 10 to the five cells per mil down to 10 to the four cells per mil. So from 100,000 to 10,000, so you've, you've got that reduction there exponentially. It's really interesting. It has, it, from its mode of action, it is a biphasic mode of action, which means we've got a two-stage process. And you see here uh, in this electromicrograph, your Britannomyces cells free-floating in the wine. When we add our chitosan, which is this much longer uh, molecule here, you're seeing the ad adsorption or adhesion of Britannomyces onto the, the chitin matrix. That makes, um, this, the, it's, makes it much heavier, so it's going to settle out of the wine. So th your first phase of action is actually a fining action, very similar to lysozyme, where you've got an adsorption and then a settling. And what the uh, second phase is, is that the, the chitin actually breaks down, it interacts with the cell wall and cell membrane, breaking those down, causing intracellular damage and uh, ultimately cellular leakage. So the cells just are no longer able to survive in the wine environment because they are so damaged. But in saying that, if we, there's definitely a strain specificity when it comes to looking 
at these chitin derivatives on different populations of organisms. And we can see the culturability from uh, seven log down to no cells in strain E1 and strain 11A. So what we are seeing is when we have zero grams per hectolitre of no side added, our population remains standard over the course of 10 days. Strain E1, you'll see that at eight grams per hectolitre, we've got a, a pretty rapid drop down in population over an eight day period and the population bottoms out at 10 to the three cells per mil from over 10 to the six cells. Uh, four grams per hectolitre, a similar uh, decline in population, whereas the two gram, you see nothing for six days before again, bottoms out just above that 10 to the three. Whereas strain 11, you've, 11A, you've got a very different um, population response at the eight gram, four gram, two gram, and zero gram per hectolitre. Whereas at the eight gram per hectolitre, our cells actually, we had um, a complete reduction. So there's definitely strain specificity. And if you can see this from the actual technical data sheet, there's definitely a, a matrix specificity as well. And part of that can be the strain specificity. So what we say, the effect of chitosan and Britannomyces is very interesting but you, with you having a dosage, dosage impact, a matrix impact, a population impact, and it is also depending on the strain. The one thing we will say with these uh, chitin derivates is they can't remove any negative sensory properties that have already been produced. So best practices never used before malactic fermentation because it does have an impact on uh, lactic acid bacteria sometimes. And this is sometimes it makes us cautious. The other reason that you never want to use it before is it works best on clarified wine. Once you add this, if it gets trapped up in all the grape solids or the winemaking solids, it can't come in contact with the organism. Therefore, it is not going to be able to impact it. Once you add it, you've got to mix it because we showed this, uh, the stratifications of the different organisms in the vessel. You rack after 10 days because depending on the strain specificity, once you impregnate through the cell wall and the membrane of the organism you have, all those goodies leaking out from inside the cells in the matrix, and that could include some nutrients. So we don't want to cause herself any secondary issues. Because of the how it works, we do suggest that you wait 30 days post-treatment for the microbiological analysis. And that microbiological analysis is so important because of the strain specificity. So the chitin derivates, no Breton side, are back to less. And again, targets Brett or lactics. Now, the one thing we will say is that these are on the part of the regulations that deal with domestic winemaking. So even though they're approved in the US under 24.250 and they're approved by the OIV, you um, are not supposed to export wines that have been treated with no red side. If you want to use them together, you absolutely can. If you've got some Britannomyces, some lactic acid bacteria and acetic acid bacteria, then we suggest that you use them at half of the lower end of the dosage range. So chite, no Breton side for Britannomyces, back to less for lactics and acetics. But if back to less is for lactics and lysozymes for lactics, how do you decide what to use? And this is kind of my go-to. This is um, how I make the decision. You might have other things that you want to factor. But really, when is lysozyme applicable? When is bactylis applicable? Or when are they both 
are neither of them applicable. So that is kind of highlighted in here with uh, lysozyme. If uh, allergens are a concern to you, well, you might want to use Bactolas. If you have a lactic acid infection, they're both applicable. However, if you have a lactic anesthetic, then the Bactolas should be able to heal to help with the acidic as well as the lactic. If the wine has not gone through malactic fermentation, then lysozyme is more applicable. If you don't want the wine to go through ML, they're both equally applicable with a little bit more staying power and protection through a back to less addition, especially in um, high tan or in wines with, with tannins. If you've got lots of solids and lysozyme does a little bit better, you don't want to rack. Well, neither of them are particularly applicable. We do recommend racking. Um, the length of contact time is similar and the treatment level is pretty similar. So it just depends on what you're looking for. So ethanol and sorbate really quickly. Um, when you're working with late harvest desserts and fortified wines, we're, we say that concentrate is, is stable. And that's because we're assuming that sugar above 780 grams per liter is microbiologically stable and alcohol above 17 and a half is microbiologically stable. So what we can do with that is we can take these two things, pop them together into a Dell unit calculation. The only difference between these two calculations is how I'm expressing my residual sugar grams per liter or grams per hundred mils. So 4.5 times your alcohol plus your RS. And if your number comes up with more than 75, that one should be microbiologically stable due to the other hurdles like SO2 and pH. Sorbic acid is a yeast inhibitor. So it is a microcidal, excuse me, it's microstatic, I apologize. Sorbic acid is insoluble in wine. That's why we use potassium sorbate, um, which is about 75% sorbic acid. So how much we would add is um, in grams per liter is 1.35 times your desired add. The um, higher the ethanol, the lower the pH, the less sorbate that you need. And we always suggest if you're using sorbate, that you use in conjunction with some sort of bacteria inhibitor, whether it's Bactolase, Lysozyme, or SO2, because the bacteria can metabolize the sorbate and convert it into something that we recognize as geranium taint. Uh, good seller practices really quickly, shouldn't be any news to anyone, but just remembering they are, um, giving you hurdles is maintaining your cool cellar temperature. The cooler the temperature helps to slow down the microbial growth. And the limited contact with air helps to slow down the growth of anything that requires oxygen. So that's why when we talk about treating, we always say topping and treating. So you're managing your headspace and your antimicrobials. A clarification is a means of microbial control because the clearer the wine, the less little lifeboats there are um, for the organisms to hang on to in the wine. Therefore, they're going to fall out of solution. So, you, so your clean racking is important. And remember the clarification fining, whether you're using bentonites, gelatins, PVPPs, some of the newer non-allergenic, like the, the um, key ups, the key refining um, can help. So you want to get the wine down so you, you can clarify it and filter it cleanly. And remember to remove yeast, we want to say 0 0.8 micron and bacteria 0 0.45 micron and making sure that the wine is not recontaminated post-filtration. Lastly, but by absolutely no means least, is 
Think about your microbes and SO2 use. What we know with certain organisms, mainly acetic acid bacteria and Britannomyces, when we add SO2, we could in, it adds in a stressor and the organisms can protect themselves by going into a viable but non-culturable state. So if you're plating, you might not see, or you probably won't see them because they won't grow on that nutrient-rich media. So you might think you're safe. In actual fact, you're not. The other thing, there's been some papers published that show the uh, SO2 addition. The papers did not discuss the dosage of SO2, but it can cause the cells to shrink by up to 22%. So again, that might be a filtration consideration. So to sum up, controlling microbes, if you need to control acetic acid bacteria, your SO2 and your bactylus. If you need to control lactics, SO2, bactylus, and lysophen. And to control yeast, you've got your SO2, your nobret inside of fresh hyomyces and sorbate. Uh, from a chemical hurdle standpoint. So it's really important to know your wines, to react to the results and employ the hurdles appropriately so that you can exploit the weaknesses of your organisms. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Darn for questions. And just remind everyone, if you don't have our 2020 handbook, it is available on the homepage of the website with, with a beautifully written introduction about all of your friends at Scott Lab. So with that, before I turn it to Darren, thank you so much for your time. I greatly appreciate it. And I hope everybody is staying nice and healthy. Yeah, thank you, Nicola. That was awesome, as usual. Thank you very much for that. We got a fair amount. We got a fair amount of questions today. Um, also, I uh, just want to let you know, I'm sorry, uh, we're usually 11 to 12 we'll, with a little time over. So if you have to leave, um, that's okay. We're going to post the webinar with maybe some of the answers. If we don't get to all the questions today, um, I'll, I'll track them and see if I can answer them at least online um, and miss, especially with some help from Nicola. I want to thank you guys again for coming. And um, thanks for doing the polls. If you hang on there, I'll share some of the results of the polls. They're always as interesting as such. And if you submit an a question, thank you very much. I, I made some notes and I even responded somewhat to some of the questions already. And we're gonna, I'm gonna go ahead, if you don't mind, I'm gonna um, shoot some questions to Nicola. It's kind of a lightning round. Um, I'm gonna rephrase some of the questions just for time. And um, I'm apologize if it's not quite correct. Again, you can always email me with the complaint. I didn't answer the question correctly, or if I didn't really um, uh, phrase the question correctly, you can email me at darrenm at scottlab.com, darrenm at scottlab.com. They hang in there again long enough. We'll, we, we'll try not to go too over, uh, but there's about 17 questions, and that's not including the questions that were submitted pre-talk. So um, again, I'm going to go as fast as I can and hopefully talk um, touch on most of your concerns. So Nicola, really quick, I mean, you don't have to really go too hard on this, but do you, do you have any favorite method of analysis for SO2, aeration oxidation, um, redox? Is there, do you have a strong opinion about that? Or is that something for most people should just figure out on their own? Anything other than Ripper. All right. Quick I, and easy. I, okay. AO. I, I, I agree with that. Okay, AO. Yeah, that's my favorite yeah. too. AO. You, how do you feel about fruit flies? I know this is a, am I open to a Pandora's box? I'm a, a Pandora box. Uh, fruit, on this, fruit. Or? So really quickly, fruit flies, yeah. AKA vinegar flies. They're, they're nasty little guys that uh, transport organisms around our winery and are another means of spreading microbes. Fruit flies sound cute, vinegar flies, not so much, and we should not be having them in our winery environment as much as we can possibly control it. Even including pyrethrin spray if you need to, or at least try and protect your, your fermentations from them as much as possible? Generally, they don't like all the CO2. So yeah. getting things fermented as quickly as possible. Yeah, okay. Okay, that totally makes sense. I've seen, somebody mentioned bug zappers too. Anything you can do, there's some nightmare stories out there of, of yeah. literally, you know, wineries built in the middle of orchards. So like once they drop that, those apples out there, there's just a pile of fruit fries just waiting to infect your winery. And, I, and I've, I've definitely seen some nightmare situations. 
Is there, you know, if you've got clean fruit and, you know, it doesn't look too bad, and do you have a period of time that you would like a max allow, say, a safe window prior to inoculation that you'd consider uh, to be safe a day or two? Um, assuming inoculation with Saccharomyces. So again, yeah. it depends on the temperature of the fruit coming in, the pH of the fruit coming in, your use of antimicrobial agents up front. You can add some non-sac yeast. The Gaia can be used uh, to help um, crowd out the acidic acid bacteria as well as the Hansenospora and Clacara to, to help you protect the wine from um, the, these other organisms taking off. But it absolutely depends on, on the fruit conditions. Okay, so that's, and that also depends if they're adding SO2 or not. What Basically. microbial controls they're adding. Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. Depending on juice condition. Okay, great. I understand that. We're going to bounce around a little bit because the questions are coming in hot and fast. How much SO2 do you think is a, set, a safe bet to at least not if, if prevent malolactic fermentation, at least know that it's not going to go well? Is there an SO2 level that you're like, you know, so most likely you're not going to go through ML fermentation? So we talk about total SO2 with regards yeah. to bacteria because a lot of SO2 could be bound up to acetaldehyde. Bacteria like acetaldehyde. So they're like, oh, acetaldehyde in the wine. They go off the acetaldehyde, which means they cleave the bond and drive up the free SO2. Therefore, they poison themselves. It's, it's a very silly little reaction that they go over. Normally, a total SO2, and it's all the other wine conditions depending, so pH, temperature, alcohol, but normally below 65 total, I don't even blink. Mm. But again, okay. it's those other conditions um, that are sometimes more impactful. So if you've got a total SO2 of 60 and an alcohol of 16, that's going to be challenging. So you okay, want to yeah. optimize that by managing temperature, having that cl as close to 68, which is 20 mm -hmm. Celsius as possible. So conversely too, if you're, if you're trying to like not use SO2 and you've got a high pH wine necessarily with an alcohol about 50%, you still run the risk of, of going through some lactic acid mediated mm -hmm. spoilage. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Especially when you're above pH 3.56. What, what is your opinion about the, the long-term aging potential of a wine with low SO2 additions? Like say less than 0.5 molecular. Is it, is it just your thought is that eh, it's not the best way to go about it? It's at some point, you know, risk is too high? It's depending on the winery, the winemaker's philosophy, um, and the actual chemistry of the wine. So what is the alcohol? How are you maintaining your headspace? How are you maintaining your temperature? How much analysis are you doing? Mm, okay. Um, and also, what are you doing from an antioxidant perspective? Okay. Because right, SO2, okay. you've got to take care of both. Um, right, aspects. right. That's something that, you know, when we talk about low SO2 winemaking, there is, there is so much to discuss as far as managing microbes with that SO2. But then there's a whole other ball game we have to worry about or play where, where, where oxygen, which is, you know, my opinion of oxygen is not terroir. You know, I've run into enough folks that are like, taste this wine that's, that's oxidized. See, this is the terroir. And I'm like, well, oxygen's all over the whole world. It's probably not a great measure of your terroir if you're oxidized. So if you are looking at doing low SO2 winemaking, oxid, don't, please don't, you know, ignore oxygen as part of that issue. Is there an effective enough way of removing lysozyme before heat protein stabilization? Like say, for instance, I don't know. You yeah, half a, pound, half a pound to one pound per thousand gallons. That's enough to remove the lysozyme? It, it, it should be. And um, we used to say run your heat stability test at 50 as well as 60. Yeah. Um, and, and see if there's a difference. But okay. really, you want to remove the, the lysozyme in, in white wines, especially. Red wines is going to be removed anyway because of the tannins. Ciders. Is lysozyme recommended or effective for ciders? Um, the bacteria, don't know if they're in cider, Pinot Noir, Zinfandel, or Chardonnay. 
right? Okay. So it's an uh, effective against a certain group of organisms. Um, so there's no reason why it should not be impactful in that matrix. Okay. What about repeat use of kytosan? Can you just keep using it to reduce cell populations or is this a one-time deal? Oh, you, you can do several additions, um, especially now we're learning more about strain specificity. So you can do one ad, get it racked, um, find out what your population is. There are some winemakers in Europe that after they do the first ad, the racking, they will do a second ad and not rack it to, to mm. confer some sort of hopefully stability over time. Um, there's some studies now up to about 18 months that mm. confer that stability, but it's very much strain dependent, matrix dependent. So it's, you can do that as long as you keep up with your analysis. Gotcha. That's, that's totally sound. Totally sound. So then, um, you know, I, I, I couldn't help but notice, and I, my experience of Kaidazen too, is it's not great to to use for a malolactic fermentation. Can you consider kytosan an effective way to prevent malolactic fermentation? As long as the wine is clarified. So white okay. wines, yes. Um, in red wines, it's much more difficult until you've done a clarification because the kytosan just gets trapped up with all of the other solids in the wine. So you don't get contact between the organism and the kytosan. Oh, okay, makes sense. Does, it's a great question. Does sorbate stop bread since it is a yeast? It's more effective against Saccharomyces. Ah, okay. More effective. Okay. Uh, the way to, to determine is normally by the time you have bread, if you're not, if you're picking up sensory wise, you're, you're already in um, troubled waters. Yeah. But you, your way to do it would be to dose bottles and, and um, plate them and see if you've got anything growing. So you would look at something we call MIC, minimum inhibitory concentrations. Mm, 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 mm. I, 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 I very, very much remember those, especially when yes. it came down to Velcrin. Does Bactylis have an impact on base wine for sparkling? And I suppose the question really is, does it have an impact on aroma or flavor? Those are always very difficult questions to answer okay, yeah. because the product itself is inert. So it doesn't have any aromas or flavors. So if you have a wine treated with and a wine treated without and the one without, you get some sort of microbial bloom, they're going to taste different. And the difference you know, is because you've prevented growth in one versus another. Yeah, and you know, we had a follow-up question, basically, it's at, which is, is, it's a very good question, actually, too. And this is maybe not something you can answer, but does it affect, mm. you think, impact on Thanks. bottle fermentation, bubble formation? Basically, you're talking about mousse retention, you know, aging and disgorging. I mean, do we have a lot of data that's out there or, or people that um, have used it in face sparkling without interfering with any of those things? So welcome to everybody, how my brain thinks. <laughs> Let me this think is why we're here. Yeah. <laughs> For people. So, yeah, totally. Kyrosan is the deacetylation of chitin. Every time a yeast divides, it puts down a, it get, the mother cell gets a birth scar and the daughter has a bud scar. So, by the time the cell's divided its maximum, which is generally five times during the fermentation, I think you've got about 5% uh, chitin there as part of the, the, the scarring. So when the, when you're, this not base wine, but on tirage for autolysis, you're going to have some chitin in there anyway. So I don't see why it would have an impact on mousse fermentation or, or, or mousse retention, sorry. Uh, the person we can ask is uh, Fernando Zamora from the University of Tarragona. He's done a lot of work on um, max height of, mm. of the moose and things. But yeah, let, let's find out. We, we'll ask uh, Professor Zamora. Great. That's actually a great suggestion, actually. Let's do that. Um, and also, <laughs> you guys, it, it, it's 1210, so um, we're going over the time. I'm not sure how your time is. I've got a, a, probably another 
eight or nine questions. So do you, let's just keep going until it just becomes too much. We've had a couple people drop out, obviously, because they've probably got another appointment and I apologize for that. But um, let's just keep going. And then um, at some point though, before anybody else leaves, I want to point out there's a survey at the end for which uh, please fill out. We are going to be using that for maybe potential topics in the future and just give us a, just general feedback. Um, I also have some pollings I can share at the very end. If you're still hanging in there, I've got at least till 1230 um, booked for this thing. So, you know, we'll, we'll go on as far as you can. And of course, I don't want to use too much of your time, uh, Nicola, if there's any important oh, time you need fine. to leave. Okay, you know, and, and any of those other folks that had to leave, those poor, poor folks that had to leave to do other things, we are going to post this webinar online or at least ask me with Darren M at scottlab.com, D-A-R-R-E-N-M at scottlab.com, and I can try and get you a copy of the webinar. So let's just keep going. I'll just do fast. Well, hopefully we'll get through this um, and keep people pretty much uh, interested. Tannins and lysozyme. You know, that's mm -hmm. a question that I think about um, because I have used lysozyme in the past to inhibit some lactic acid bacteria during cold soak. So do you seem to worry about that too much, adding tannins um, too close to lysozyme? Do you think there's an inhibition or any kind of direct inactivation? We're, we are currently reevaluating enzyme tannin impact. Um, we used to always say with our enzymes within our range, as well as our tannins in our range have a six to eight hour window in between adding. Um, it was just kind of a general comment, but some of the newer work that's done because of our advanced analytical ability, um, that might not quite be the case anymore. So mm -hmm. TBD, best practices at this point is to always to respect that, that window. Um, okay. it, in, a, in a white wine at least. In a red wine, you've got so much tan in there anyway. Um, especially in the wine phase. In the juice phase, you don't. Um, so it's okay. going to, you're not going to have that inactivation in the wine phase. You, you're going to be bound up pretty quickly. The more tannins in the wine, because proteins and, and tannins bind, lysines protein, or it's an enzyme, enzymes are proteins. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure if that okay. quite answered it, but. I mean, it's an honest question to be honest with you. It's a, it's a tough, it's actually a tough question. We don't, you know, the, the bottom line is. I've had tons of experience adding enological tannins in lysozyme um, and not tons, but a, enough to think that I was getting the, the, the outcome I wanted. There was indeed an impact with the tannin and there was an in, indeed an impact with the lysozyme. But again, we, we don't really know. Sometimes these things are still, you know, there's still some yeah. opening there. Look, and then some- Work by oh, River Gayon, you've got that really quick impact. Yeah. So you might, you should get, a, some reduction and then your tannin might limit it. So okay. I think you'll get some. Okay. Um, um, any of the SO2 alternatives, um, I think I'm just going to go ahead and answer this question. Basically, are they Thanks. OMRI standards? Do they meet OMRI regulations? And as far as I understand, you can find that on the internet and you can Google the OMRI standards to find products that will meet the OMRI standards. But um, unless you have anything to add, I think that's pretty much the answer to that. These are not um, yeah. With Gaia, a non-sac strain, um, is it useful uh, near the, uh, is it, okay, well, the question is, I'll read you the question and then you can decide. We've got a oh. couple more questions after that. Could you discuss Gaia? Is it most useful near the must air interface or could I mix it at the crusher? You can mix it at the crusher. Okay. Anytime you add organisms, you are, you want to mix them in. So whether this is Gaia, which is the Metronicovia fructicola, which um, protects against acetic acid bacteria and um, non-sac during the pre-fermentation stages or saccharomyces during the fermentation or enococcus for ML. You want to mix the organisms in so that they are actually acting all as biocontrol agents. And also if you leave, for example, all your saccharomyces on the top of the vessel, the cells are going to go from a nutrient replete to a nutrient depleted environment very very quickly and they're going to switch their metabolism so that's happening here and then everything else that's happening down here is you're not having that microbial crowding impact so the other organisms are able to exert their profile 
to always mix it in, whether that is directly into the hopper in the case of Gaia, or um, yeah. after, you know what I mean, yeah. Yeah, no, it totally makes sense. Um, bouncing around a little bit, sorry. Uh, rate of addition for sorbet. I mean, I, I remember using 200 to 400 parts when we're making finished wine, prepping wines that, that we didn't, uh, we, or we couldn't use Valkyrie on. Uh, do you have any so, feeling about, a strong opinion about a rate of sorbet? So that's the thing, in our industry, we want general. We want to say, okay, yeah. 200 parts sorbet, call it good. That's generally okay. the, the, what you'll see out there. But if, if you, you can adapt it based on that alcohol, that final alcohol, and okay. generally, sorbet is used in lower alcohol products, relatively speaking, which is why we talk about a 200 part per million edition. Gotcha. Gotcha. Uh, uh, another opinion question. Um, how, how, are you digging the wine business calculator for figuring out free sulfur editions? Have you used it? Do you think it's accurate? I mean, I, I love it, it, but... It depends which one you're using. Yeah. I think you need to know how to do it longhand. Yeah, okay, yes. Is, if you can't get access to the calculation or if if it goes haywire someday right yeah. so i use i might use it to check my math being quite honest okay. i do my math okay. longhand use that as my backup and you know her and i close. go ahead sorry no and this go should ahead. be close right they should be close yeah. Yeah, I, you know, um, uh, Nicola teaches and I, and I teach some wine microbiology and I, I force my students to still do that calculation, <laughs> even though it's so easy to do. But honestly, when I'm out there making wine, sometimes I just, I prefer the tablets, the effervescent tablets, the Enodose, but you know, mm -hmm. sometimes you want to make KMBS and I do find myself using that calculator. I got a question about cans and it, you know, I'm going to touch on it and I'm just going to say it to you. What about SO2 additions in cans? What is the maximum allowed parts per million of SO2 you'd recommend for use in cans? Cans right now, just to, you know, my experience with helping folks with cans is right now the liners are, are, are what you're really concerned about. And the best, my best advice about liners in, in, in bought, uh, packaging specs is to go to the liner manufacturer, the can operator. Those guys are usually the best for figuring out what the liner addition limits are. And I would trust their um, opinion because they're the ones that are typically paying for the damages um, if when things do occur or fall out of spec. Um, and then there's also a question about pH and SO2 combination. If you guys want, email me at darrenm at scottlab.com and I'll try and answer those questions as much as possible. During the presentation, she said that once alcohol got above 3.5%, it was more difficult environment for spoiler organisms. What kinds of sporadic organisms are the most likely culprits in mid to late stages of fermentation? And this is like potentially problems that like when you're 20 bucks or below. What do, you what do you typically see there? Wait, early in the fermentation or late in the fermentation? Late in the fermentation. So late in the fermentation, you've already got 10, 12 alcohol, then it's lactic yeah. acid bacteria. Okay, that's your, the, big, that's your big bad boy. Yeah, and okay. um, that's why we normally, if you're having a stuck fermentation, we'll say to you measure malic and VA. The malic to see if we've got any lactics there. We can do a small SO2 addition late in the fermentation, 15, 20 parts pH depending, just to try and knock the bacteria back a little bit. Um, okay. Yeah, normally and when you're adding, when you're adding sorbent SO2, Back to sorbet and SO2, is there a time frame you're thinking of separating between the SO2 edition and the sorbet edition? Do you, do you have any good rule of thumb there? I probably wouldn't do them in the same bucket. Okay. But I would add one, mix it in, then do the second. I might do the SO2 first, make sure I don't have bacteria there, and then sorbet it. Okay. But okay. I, I would not add my sorbet until I knew my bacterial load. All right, that's actually a very good point because we, we don't want to overuse some things if you don't, if you can't, if, I mean, if you can prevent it, overuse or non-usage. And I, I definitely think um, um, it's using any kind of these agents, uh, the, the, the better picture you have of the current microbial condition um, um, helps you with the, the best outcome possible when it comes to making these additions. I think that's it. I mean, I've got a couple more questions, but it's 1220. 
Um, I have one more question, but it sounds like it says, would you add the license time first and then wait? Um, I'm trying to find if that tied into a previous question, which I can't seem to find. So um, I think that's gonna be it. I apologize if we didn't hit all the questions you can. It's, it's 1220, I think an hour and 20 is just about enough time. I wanna thank you all again. I think that um, for the most part, we got what we wanted. Again, I don't wanna hammer this, but if you've got any other questions that we didn't able to answer at this time, you can email me at Darren, uh, Darren M at scottlab.com. You wanna hold on if you guys are interested, here's some polling results. Um, and if I apologize, Nicola, if you need to go, just let me know. Yep, uh, but I can show you guys some polling results. So uh, the polling, I only let for a couple minutes and after a while. So here's the first question, use and juice and must. Um, what form of SO2? Most of you guys use powdered KMBS during the juice and must stage. There's some liquid SO2, um, some tablets, some granules, and then some of, uh, a very few of you, but some still don't use SO2 at this stage. Um, second poll was when, when do you use, um, all right, what stage, what, what type of SO2 you use in finished wine? The results for that were most of you use powder KMBS, a little more heavy on the liquid SO2, a little more heavy on the effervescent tablets and your granulars. I honestly, be honest with you guys, I've done, we did um, impact or, or cost effective studies at one of the places I worked. And I can't stress enough, if you've got that effervescent tablets and you've got a lot of barrels that need to be we didn't, you know, we had so many people we had to hire to top, you know, five, 6,000 barrels. And I could not stress enough how great it was to use those effervescent tablets. And this was a custom crush alternating proprietorship. So there was a wide range of different wines in there. And, and I just love that, that efficiency in the tablets. Lysozyme uses. When do you use lysozyme? Well, it was pretty much across the board. The big winner, at least for today, is most of the people that answered the poll. 62% said they never use lysozyme. And then the rest use it sometimes in the state, in the must stage. The next biggest one is either during aging to prevent spoilage, and then it broke down after that. Um, some used during primary fermentation. And then with the last poll, we had, um, uh, last poll we had Kaidazan, and that Kaidazan poll is here. And Again, we got about 69% of the people that answered the poll um, said they don't use Zykitazan. 15% um, uh, use it during aging with SO2. 13% use it just to do bready. There's some helping with stuck fermentations, maybe before fermentation, and a couple of people did, did answer the question, too coffee when there is no creamer. I was curious if anybody tried to eat Kaidazan. <laughs> we do have three people out there that love to consume Kaidazan. All right, so I want to thank you again. Uh, it's been great. It's been fun. Um, I think that's it. Thank you so much for your time. I know you guys, we're all busy. We have things to do. Hopefully we're safe out there. Our plan with these webinars to be semi-regular, keep them engaging. Um, please don't hesitate to fill out that survey. Really like that. That's the next step for this. You can expect another webinar coming. I just right now don't have the topic. But you'll probably get a notice a week before and you know we'll try and keep it around an hour but if we go over um we'll just go over and you can just hang in there please submit the survey don't hesitate to reach, reach out if you have any questions or comments darren m at scottlab.com darren m at scottlab.com also that's online if you want to google that thank you so much from all of us at scott laboratories we want to wish you and your families most importantly great health and happiness Thank you again, and we're gonna call it. Do you have any other final words, Nicola, before I close it out? Nope. All right. Uh, well, I think thanks. you've heard me enough. <laughs> <laughs> I stay loved healthy, every minute people. of it. <laughs> stay healthy, stay happy, and we'll see you all soon. All right, thanks guys. Email call anytime you want. This is Darren Michaels, host, Scott Laboratories, fermentation outside technical expert. Stay safe, stay safe. Thank you. <laughs>